Heavenly Father, on this Father's Day, we thank you that you are our forever perfect Heavenly Father, the Father we've always wanted and needed. We thank you that we can enjoy your fatherhood because you, in amazing love, gave us your only begotten Son, Jesus, to be our Savior, making reconciliation with you a reality. We honor you as our Heavenly Father. We reverence your name and majesty, worshiping you as our God and trusting you to provide for everything we need, body and soul, in life, in death, and in the forever ages to come with you in all your glory. We pray for our earthly fathers and grandfathers and spiritual fathers. Help them feel valued, respected, appreciated, and to know how critical and vital they are needed and their fatherly guidance and love and all that they do to bless our families and to help us know you. Lord, we know from your word that you instruct fathers to bring up their children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. We thank you for the men who are leading according to your word and spirit, the ones that are laying their lives down for your purposes. We pray you'll continue to use these men to lead their families and to lead other men and boys to know Jesus. We pray you will strengthen fathers of our nation that you will continue to empower churches and organizations and individuals to invest in fathers and fatherhood for the sake of our children and the gospel. We thank you too for fathers who have opened up their hearts and their homes to adopt children, to love them as their very own and teach them and impress upon their minds and their hearts the good news of the gospel of Jesus and your fatherly love for them as well. We pray also, Lord, for single fathers, whether they are raising children alone or even if they're doing the best they can with the time they have. We pray for strength, protection, for wisdom and discernment to help them through whatever trials they may be facing. We thank you, Lord, for these men and ask that you will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus, help meet all of their needs, and that they would daily experience your peace that surpasses all human understanding. Lord, we also lift up the dads that are not stepping up to the plate as fathers for whatever reason. Once again, Lord, in so many ways, we've allowed the evil one to get into our lives and wreak havoc on what you have said is good. We pray for these men to come to their knees and repent that they would turn from their ways and seek you and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray also for their children and the moms who are parenting alone because of these decisions they've made. We pray you would step in as a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows in these situations and that their story would be another testimony that nothing is too hard for you. We pray for a revival of manhood, biblical manhood, for fathers to lead their family, families by starting each day on their knees and asking you, Father, for help, for guidance, for wisdom, and for assurance and encouragement that you give all the grace to the callings you've given to fathers who trust in you who look to you, who love you, who fear you. God, we know that it says in your word in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, that you will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And so as our creator, our savior, as God, our heavenly father, we believe your word. And we'd ask that you would cause that to happen more and more and that there would be eternal fruit that comes from godly fathers, godly families who center on Jesus Christ, and that you, Lord, in your great mercy, would restore the families, not only in churches, but in our communities and in our nation, and restore them back to the way that you intended and you have commanded in your word. 
Lord, we also pray for your comfort to those who miss their fathers, who wish they could talk with them about life issues, share good times together, and most of all, spend time in your word, enjoy praying to you and singing your praises and worshiping you. And we're thankful for Jesus who died and rose again, and we know that one day there will be the greatest reunion ever, and we'll be reunited with all of the church triumphant. You'll wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death will be no more, and all things will be made new again. Thank you for this glorious living hope that we have in you, Jesus. And Father, as a church family especially, we are in such awe, mixed with profound thankfulness and gratitude for what you have done in our little brother Elliot Dykstra's life this past week. We thank you for the new heart that he received and for all the medical skill and wisdom that you blessed a medical team to successfully accomplish this heart transplant for Elliot. We pray you'll continue to watch over with your fatherly favor and goodness, little Elliot, and strengthen him. Help his body to adjust to everything it needs to adjust. Continue to give grace to Nick and Kelly, to Amelia, to the family. And at the same time, Lord, we also grieve and we pray with heavy hearts for the family who had to make a very unbelievably hard decision be near to them, Father, comfort them, uphold them, surround them with your love as they go through this very hard time. And we pray that in your time and in your way, it would be so wonderful that these two families could be forever friends and family in you. So thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you're a miracle-working God. And thank you that you remember our frame Can you help us? Every time we come to you and every time and every situation we need you, you're always there. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you too for the Leedsmas for their prayers and that you would bless Steve and Julie and Chloe as they continue to trust you and your leading and guidance in their adoption process for Willa Marie. There are huge obstacles, Father, that are beyond human ability. And so we look to you to work in the hearts of people and individuals. It, if it's your will, Lord, that Will and Marie would be adopted into their family. They've had encouraging signs this past week. And we pray that you will bless the progress that is being made and hear their prayers and give them good news. And we pray thanking you how you're working in their lives, not only loving Willa Marie, but her family and extended family too. We see so much gospel work going on. It's a beautiful thing. We pray that your name would be exalted in this situation. We pray for continued strength and help for Jacqueline in her treatment program. May she feel your blessing upon her. Grant her the healing mercy she and all of us pray for. May she also know each day your great love and presence in her life. For you are the God of great surprises. And so please bless Jacqueline and Brian and family. Give them good news and great days together in you. May our brother George Device experience your goodness and faithfulness to him in a successful surgery this week. Be with him in the recovery time as well. And we pray that all will go well for George as he trusts in you and gives you the glory. And God of all comfort, we thank you for the Christian life of our sister Liz Mason. For many years, she witnessed of her trust in Jesus Christ. She taught so many family members and members of the family of God about you. And you were with her in the good times of her life and also through the valley of tears. And she as a mother and wife trusted you through each and every one of them. We ask your Holy Spirit's blessing on a memorial service for her this Thursday. May your family members and friends be comforted and challenged and encouraged to live their lives following Jesus by faith. Lord, we thank you too that Mackenzie and Curtis Dunkerley were united in Christian marriage yesterday. 
what a joyful time it was of praising you and thanking you for the gift of covenant love. And we ask your Holy Spirit to be with them and unite their hearts and their lives together in Jesus Christ and lead them and guide them as they look to you for each day of their lives together now as Christian husband and wife. We thank you too for our gospel friends in East Asia. Bless Jonathan and Marion and Calvin and all of their friends whom they serve in order to bring good news and help and hope that lasts forever. Though we're thousands of miles apart, we're joined in heart and prayers and love. Give them so many reasons to be thankful spiritually and physically. Thank you for our gospel friends too in the Ukraine. We think of George and Sarah, Elizabeth and Matthew and Abigail. Give them many reasons to rejoice with your people who love you there. May they see blessings on their labors. and May your people be strengthened in their faith, deepen in their understanding of your word and equipped to bless others with the gospel. So grow your church and make it powerful and a strong witness to Jesus in Ukraine. We pray for Pastor Robert Svontak and his family, the church in Mukachevo. May your people there love Jesus and love to learn the Bible more and more as they hear it preached and taught and sung and lived out every day of their Christian lives. We pray for many people to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Thank you too for Sarah and Dami in Nigeria. Empower them by your spirit to be compelling witnesses to Jesus and the hope and the life-changing difference he saves his people to live. Bless Sarah's teaching skills and abilities and gifts to train teachers and provide Christian curriculum for students in Nigeria. Cause many children to hunger for your truth and to be most satisfied in you. We thank you too for Scott and Marcia Gurink. Give them many reasons to thank you for Spanish-speaking families, people here and in Mexico who are growing in their faith and their knowledge of your word. And thank you for the excellent example of gospel service all our friends in various nations are setting for us. They inspire us, they encourage us to gospel service wherever you send us. And we pray, Father, for more opportunities to serve and bless you and bless your church and your people with our prayers, our financial support, and mission trips in order to do work projects and bless other people in the name of Christ. God, our refuge and our strength and ever-present help, give us safety physically and spiritually, rejoicing in you and remembering everywhere we go that we belong to you and we're on a mission, a mission to honor you, to honor the Lord Jesus in all that we do. Help us, Lord. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be a faithful church family, faithful to you, faithful to the word, faithful to each other and to the lost who need Jesus just like we do. We pray this in his great and glorious name, the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Our text for this morning's sermon is from the New Testament, the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'll begin reading at verse 1. We're going to focus on verses 9 through 11 for uh, this Father's Day. Giving thanks to God for Christian fathers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. What you're about to hear now is the very word of God. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, 
God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we would proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So as far as we're going to read this morning, and may the Holy Spirit help him who preaches and help all of us who listen and then who give to God our response and our desire to want to trust and obey God's word for the glory of God. Dear Trinity family and friends, on this Father's Day, we do indeed give thanks to the Lord for the power of the gospel, for the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a man, especially a father and a grandfather and a spiritual father. It truly is remarkable that what we've read here and what we've heard read from the Apostle Paul, that he could present, invite, and welcome a close review and inspection even, even of his own Christian life, his integrity as an apostle, as a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's truly remarkable because those of us who remember his life before he was a Christian, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, uh, for example, here's what the Apostle Paul said about his former life before Jesus Christ saved him. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor of Christians, an insolent opponent, a violent man. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So here's the Apostle Paul at one time before Christ saved him. He was a violent man, a blasphemer, a persecutor of Christians. And God in his mercy, God in his grace, God in his love, saved Saul of Tarsus and not only forgave him of all of his sins, but gave him a new heart and put the Holy Spirit in him and called him to become a gospel missionary, a preacher of the Christ Jesus, willing to even suffer opposition over and over again and eventually a martyr for Jesus Christ. While he was getting roughed up and beat up preaching Jesus Christ, sometimes he had to leave certain areas when he was on these missionary journeys, certain towns and cities, he had to leave. And when he would leave, he would go to another city and there he would find a synagogue and he would make connections there showing Christ from the Old Testament. Some people came to believe as the Holy Spirit opened their hearts and their minds to see Christ in the scriptures. Some people did not believe, resisted it, opposed it. And they would go after Paul and his companions. And one of those cities was Thessalonica. He was there for three Sabbath days preaching the gospel. 
And God granted repentance and faith for people in that city. And again, opposition came. And so the Apostle Paul had to leave abruptly. And he was so thankful for how the gospel came to these people in Thessalonica. He wanted to know how they were doing since he was absent from them. He sends Timothy to them. Timothy comes back and says, they're still believing in Jesus. They're still loving each other. They're still persevering in their faith in Jesus. And he was overwhelmed with joy and thanks to God for what was going on in this new church plant in Thessalonica. And now he's writing this letter and he's encouraging them. He's giving fatherly instructions. Did you notice that in our text this morning? Isn't this remarkable? Here was this violent, mean man, radically changed by Jesus Christ, so much so that he could say, look, you can check out the way I lived amongst you, the way I preached, the way I taught. You can examine it. So when those critics of the Apostle Paul, those who were opposing him, those false teachers would make false accusations, he could say, you're witnesses and so is God. Here's how I live my life. And then he mentions both a mother and a father. Because this is God's way of reminding all of us that both are important in the family. The family is the basic building block of a healthy society and healthy churches and a healthy country and nation. And so this once violent man, so transformed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit through the gospel, says, you know, when I came to you as baby Christians, as new Christians, I was tender with you. I was gentle with you like a mother and her new babies. And now here we focus on verse 11. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So dads, fathers, grandfathers, and all of us who are honoring our fathers today, here's reasons for which I want to challenge all of you to think, to pray. And when you're having your family meal together today, your time with your father, I would love to be there at your house. I really would. And I would love to hear all the things you're going to say that you're thankful for about your fathers, your grandfathers, your spiritual fathers, church leaders, and give glory to God. And let's let the scriptures guide our thinking and our thanks today about Christian fathers. We noticed here, first of all, we want to thank Christian fathers for their hard work. Their hard work in answering God's call to love their families and support their families. You notice in verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, you remember, brothers, our labor and our toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Now, the Apostle Paul had a right to receive a living from preaching the gospel. But this was a baby church. This was a new church plant. These were young Christians. So he chose, also in light of the criticism that was coming to the apostles about their motives. Oh, they're just doing this because they're in it for the money. They're in it because they're in it for their own fame, their own glory. And you could hear the Apostle Paul saying, we're not here to be people pleasers. And we're not in this for the money because we could pretty much live a much easier, safer life than getting beat up, roughed up, persecuted for preaching the gospel. And so they took a choice not to receive monetary gifts or support from them for their physical daily bread. They worked day and night. Paul was a tent maker. Most likely he would preach during the day. He would teach them God's word. He would mentor them like a father. And then at night he would work to support himself. There was one other church that took offerings to help Paul during this, and that was the Philippian church. So between their own working and some offerings from the Philippians, they were able to meet their daily needs. And they didn't have to then take support from this church. They worked day and night. They stayed in the house of a guy named Jason, a Jewish believer. He got roughed up too. He got intimidated for housing them, but they didn't ask anything of Jason or take anything. They supported themselves. And likewise, we want to thank God for our fathers and thank our dads today. Dads, thank you for all the hard work. You get up in the morning, you work long hours, you're tired. And you do that so that you can provide for our families. 
You can share with your kids. And you take a lot of stress and a lot of burdens so that they don't have to worry about their next meal. They don't have to worry about their clothing. They don't have to worry about their basic daily needs. And oftentimes, a lot of extras that dads work hard for to support their families and bless their families. And we do not take that for granted. And not only your hard work, but the example that you have set in a Christian work ethic. And that's what the Apostle Paul was doing here, working hard, toiling night and day, because God teaches us in his word, our God's a working God. And he teaches us the dignity of work. Adam and Eve, before the fall, were given work to do. Work is a blessing. And a Christian work ethic starts at this. Our ultimate boss, so to speak, our ultimate employer is God. The apostles taught in the gospel in Ephesians chapter 6, as well as in Ephesians. Colossians chapter 3, that we are to work hard, not as men pleasers in the sense that we're just working for an earthly employer, but we will ultimately we work for the Lord. And so whether somebody sees us or not, we're always going to do our best on the job because God sees it. And we do this for the Lord. And when we work for the Lord, it becomes an act of worship. Work becomes sacred. God is pleased with it. And even if nobody appreciates it, even though they should, God sees and God will reward and God says that's my son that's my child that's my daughter those are my people and we are taught by godly Christian fathers that our work ethic is not only pleasing to God but it's a great witness to those whom we work with and whom we work for because they'll see our value system our integrity our honesty our hard work showing up early for work so we're prepared, giving a full day's work, always learning, improving, trying to be the best employee we can. Thank you, fathers, Christian fathers, for teaching us by your example and your instructions a Christian work ethic. And then he goes on to say, as a father, we, we exhorted you now, exhort, exhortation is the idea of teaching. Teaching God's Word. Teaching the Bible. Teaching God's commandments and pressing them upon our hearts and our minds. Thank you, Christian dads, for taking the time and making the time to teach children and family members to know the gospel, to know Jesus Christ. To know God's will for our lives in the Bible. As you know, we pray for our brother Neil Ausma. I visit him every week as he's soon going to be transitioning to his eternal home with the Lord. Some of his children are there at times when I'm visiting and I was so blessed and I wasn't surprised at all. But one of his sons said to me, you know, our dad... Every time we had a meal at this table, we were sitting at their table, Neil was there. Every time we had a meal, my dad, Neil, would read a chapter of the Bible every meal. And we have gone through the Bible umpteen times throughout our life. Thank you, Christian dads, who have answered the call of God who desire not only to feed your children physical food, which they need, and work hard for that, but you also labor spiritually, and you pray, and you discipline our family life in such a way that we also get spiritual food from the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that that's the way every family has to do it, a chapter, every meal. God gives us liberty and freedom to be creative. But what God does command us is daily we're to impress upon the hearts of our children. We're to feed our families. And so take that creativity. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Get your family in ways that they get excited about learning God's word together. Listen to them. Talk to them about what they're learning at church and, and Sunday school and other ways in their own devotions. But be a family that really makes a priority, a top priority to sharpen each other's souls and minds and hearts with a Christian world and life view around the scriptures. 
Hey, Dad, what do you think about this? Mom, what do you think about this? What about this? What about that? Well, it doesn't really matter what I think. It doesn't matter what people on TV think. It's what God thinks. It's what God says. And where do we know that and where do we find that? Right here in the Bible. And so with the Apostle Paul and Christians and fathers, Christian fathers who've gone before us, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, our, we hold every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Thank you, fathers, Christian fathers, for exhorting, coming alongside children, family members, and teaching them the gospel and God's word. Keep going. We appreciate you for it. We need it. Sometimes we don't always pay attention like we should. Sometimes we want to get out of there fast and do other things. But deep down inside today, we want to thank you for being faithful to the calling of family devotions and teaching us God's word. I remember a long time ago hearing um, a pastor, very gifted um, teacher of the Bible, and he was sharing when he was younger growing up, his dad was so faithful and devoted to teaching his family God's word that he made a, a fast, hard rule that we're always going to have devotions after breakfast every morning at such and such time. So you need to be here and ready for devotions. And if you're not and you're late, you're going to be late for whatever else comes because dad was not going to negotiate away that time. And so if they were late to school, they were late to school. And it so impressed this man and it shaped him to be a wonderful Christian, godly man, preacher and teacher for many others years later. Those are the kind of Christian dads who are heroes heroes of the faith, and we honor them and we thank them. We also notice that the Apostle Paul was like a father, not only in his work ethic and exhorting each one of you, but he also encouraged you, encouraged you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says this, Jesus and God the Father gave us eternal comfort. So that word encouraged is the same word that's translated eternal comfort. Thank you, fathers, for bringing the comfort of the gospel of Jesus Christ to us. Thank you, fathers, for those times that you take to listen to us. You know when we're hurting. And you come alongside and you say, honey, what's wrong? You can come to dad and you can share whatever's on your heart. Thank you for those times of compassion and care. Thank you for those times of knowing when we're, we're afraid or we're fearful or have anxiety and you come alongside us and you say, what's troubling you? What's bothering you? And you listen to us and you heard us. And you not only heard us and respected our thoughts and our, our opinions and our struggles, but then you took us to our Heavenly Father. And thank you, especially Christian dads and grandfathers, when you shared your own testimony, your own weaknesses, your own struggles, and how you learned by God's grace to bring that to God, your Heavenly Father. And you pass that on to children so that they too can learn to trust in the Lord and take all their anxieties and worries and find peace in leaving it all with God and His plan for our lives. Especially thank you for reminding us and teaching us how good the gospel is. How forgiving we are in Jesus Christ. It was back in the 90s, I remember going to a Christian concert. I often don't go to many of them, but we had this one particular CD and the artist happened to come to Grand Rapids and, and, and put on a concert. And I kind of learned, it was like the first time I went to a concert, but a lot of these artists then will explain a lot more of the context behind their songs and why they wrote them. And this one particular artist, this Christian artist, she said, before I sing this song, I want to tell you what inspired me to write this song. And she went on to talk about her dad, her Christian dad. And there was a time when, um, shocker, she disobeyed her dad as a girl, a little girl. Her dad was a very loving Christian dad. Her dad was consistent in loving discipline. And so when her dad called her out when she disobeyed, she was expecting the loving but firm, painful discipline of correction. But her dad did something so brilliant and so gospel-wise. 
No doubt he had been praying for this opportunity, thinking about it, talking with God the Heavenly Father about it. He waited for a most strategic moment, noticing his daughter grieving, scared because she knew she did wrong, filled with shame and guilt. He sat down with his daughter and said, what was going on in your heart when you did that? Explained all these things. Well, you know that you need to be disciplined, and she knew that. And he did something so unusual. He said, honey, this time I'm not going to discipline you as you deserve and as you admitted. And I'm so thankful you were honest, you're humble, and you're repentant. But I'm not going to give you the discipline of correction because I want you to think about Jesus and what he's done for your sins and mine. That ultimately he took the punishment for our sins and for yours. And he died on the cross so you would not enter into judgment with God for the sin of disobeying your parents, which you deserve. And he explained the love and the grace of the gospel that God the Father, who was so offended by our sins, yet in love, while we were yet sinners, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to take our penalty so that we would be forgiven. We wouldn't get that condemnation. But we go free and forgiven. And she said that when she was a little girl, that was so powerfully impressive upon her of understanding what Jesus had done for her and taking away her sins and her punishment and giving her forgiveness. And here she is years later as a grown mother, an adult, writing Christian songs from the influence of a Christian father who encouraged her with the gospel. Dads, thank you. Thank you for the time that you take Thank you for even through frustration and hurt when you see us mess up as sinners who need Jesus and you walk with us and you help us learn to discern what's going on in our hearts. You teach us Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. And you take time to say, what sin attitude, what sin issue is going on in your heart? And what did Jesus do to forgive us for that? And now that we're forgiven, what does the Holy Spirit do to help us with a new heart, replace sin attitudes and sin with the fruits of the Holy Spirit and obedience out of a thankful heart to God? Thank you, dads. Because the impression the Holy Spirit is doing through your Christian parenting and encouragement is greater than you know. And sometimes, dads, you don't see it. And sometimes you struggle and wonder if it's having any effect. It is. God's word will never return void, will always accomplish what God has set out for it to do. So keep going, dads. We love you. We appreciate and we thank your gospel encouragement. You're just like the Apostle Paul and Silvanus and Timothy and others who, like a father, encouraged young believers in the Lord. And then he says, finally, we charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I think that's a really good, like, father goal or aim. You know, sometimes families have maybe a, a plaque on their wall or something, and it's a family motto, you know, loyal or some kind of Latin phrase or something on it. Well, right here is a Christian motto for all fathers and Christian families. Walk in a manner worthy of God. That's our family motto. Hey, remember who you are? And whatever you do, walk in a manner worthy of God. And that's the idea here. It's a call, that charge, the word charge there is a call to be a witness. I remember uh, my wonderful Christian grandfather. Many of you remember him here too for many years. And he impressed upon us all, all the time. Hey, whatever you do, just be the best Christian at what you do. When we would ask about, I don't know what God wants me to do in life, thinking about calling and careers. And his godly advice was, whatever you do, just be the best Christian at what you do. You're going to be a carpenter. You're going to be a scientist. You're going to be a teacher. Whatever it is you do, just be the best Christian. Remember that you always belong to the Lord. I remember another Christian father saying, you have one big C calling in your life that will never change. 
And all the rest are just little C's. And sometimes those little C's will change. The big C, you know what it is, right, Trinity? It never changes. You're always going to be a Christian. That's the biggest thing in your life. Now, you might have a little calling here. You might be a student, and later on, you're not going to be a student. You might be employed. You might be a teacher. All those little C's are going to change. You might be working here. Years later, you're going to be working over here. That C is going to change. That C is going to change. But through it all, the big C calling never changes. It's the same idea here of walk worthy of God. Wherever you are, whoever's surrounding you, wherever God sends you, near or far away, you're always a child of God in Jesus Christ. God is always your heavenly Father. He always sees you. He loves you. He's working in your life. And so we say, God, help me walk in a manner that's worthy of this calling. That we are dearly loved children of God in Christ Jesus. Help us to think that way. Help us to speak that way. Help us a lot of times not to speak, just to close our mouth and be quiet because that's worthy of God. And help us to behave that way for the glory of God. Fathers, thank you. Thank you for being Christian dads who are humble enough to say, I'm a sinner, but I need Jesus. And I thank God that I have Jesus. I want to say in closing to anyone here today, especially dads, when you hear the Apostle Paul and all of these things, how he was like a father with spiritual children, exhorting, encouraging, and charging, and you may think to yourself, I can't measure up to that. I want to say to you, join the rest of us. Not even the holiest and godliest of fathers this side of heaven have reached perfection yet. We're all still growing. We're, still, we're all still in a process of sanctification. And today, as you hear God's word, and as you hear your kids, and you hear your grandkids thanking you for being a Christian dad, and you feel like, I don't measure up, look to Christ. And ask Jesus, and look to God, our Heavenly Father, and say, Father, please continue to work in my life and help me grow more and more at being a Christian dad, a Christ-centered dad, who exhorts, who encourages, and who charges his family members to walk worthy of God. And God, your Heavenly Father, is pleased with that, and he will help us, and he will give us the Holy Spirit. You remember what Jesus said, you earthly fathers, you know how to give good gifts to your children? How much more so will your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit? Luke 11, verse 13, ask for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, help me be a Christian dad. Help me be a Christian grandfather. Help me be a Christian mentor to others, and it will happen, and you'll grow, and you'll be a blessing. And last of all, if you're here, or you're listening to this, and you're a dad, but you don't know Jesus as Lord of your life and Savior of your life, thank you, first of all, for being a dad, and thank you for all your hard work, and thank you for what you're doing for your family. It's pleasing to God. And I can't think of a greater day than today on Father's Day for a dad to become a Christian dad. It happened in Thessalonica thousands of years ago. They were serving idol gods. And the gospel of Jesus Christ came to them through the Apostle Paul who once was an unbeliever. And Christ saved him. And there was all these spiritual dads and Christian families. And we're still talking about them today. And that can happen to you too. And you can become a Christian dad by hearing the truth about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Heavenly Father, who in love gave His Son, who calls us to repent of our sins, to be honest about it, and to bring our sins to Jesus, and ask Jesus to forgive us, and ask Him to come into your heart, into your life, and be the Lord and Savior of your heart and your life and of your family. And if I can help you or any of the spiritual godly men who are fathers too by God's grace here can help you learn how to be a Christian dad, we'd have no greater joy than to help you and walk with you in the word, in the gospel, and watch your family just give glory to God for not only dad, but dad has become a Christian. 
And he knows how much Jesus loves him. And God the Father loves him. And saved him, just like the Apostle Paul. And like so many of us here. And to help us live a life worthy of God. Dads, grandparents, thank you. Thank you so much for being Christian dads. Now, more than ever, the church needs you. It needs your Christian example of exhorting, encouraging, and charging us by your example as well as your teaching and praying to be godly men and to be godly women in our homes. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of fathers, especially fathers who know Jesus Christ, who know your word, and who labor day in and day out by their example, and also by opening the scriptures, opening their hearts and their ears to listen to us, and to point us to Christ, to teach us of the gospel of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of sanctification, how to live a holy, a righteous, and a blameless life in Christ. And so we pray that you will be greatly honored, Lord, in the sharing of Thanksgiving that's going to happen at lunchtime today with so many families here and phone conversations and other ways we communicate with our dads or grandparents, grandfathers. Lord, may you be pleased with all the Thanksgiving, the sharing and the caring, the tears, the hugs, ways that we pray and encourage each other. Lord, we pray too. Should there be some son or daughter or family member that is estranged from their Christian fathers, that today would be the day that you work powerfully in hearts and minds and do the miracle of bringing back a child to a father and a father to their child and restoring and renewing relationships in Christ. God, you are so great. You are a heavenly father. We pray each and every one of us That as we leave this place, we will walk, we will live in a manner that's worthy of the calling of God to be your dearly loved children in Jesus Christ. Lord, may every father, too, be greatly encouraged, especially those who are discouraged. Lift them up, pick them up, encourage them. That you are their heavenly father. You love them, you know what they need, and you're there for them. May they be blessed today. Grant them your peace, your strength, your hope. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.